Hello and welcome. Welcome to the WEED, Women in Environmental Artists Dialogue, Art and Activism web series. Um, we're starting with web series number three, Collaborating with Nature. In this web series, we will discuss ways that artists actively engage in creating climate solutions and promoting sustainability. We at WEED believe that art can be a powerful tool for raising awareness and promoting social change. In this web series, we are looking at ways that artists are actively engaged in creating climate solutions and in promoting sustainability. The episode today will be Art as Verb, Collaborating with Nature, a presentation by Stacy Levy. Eco-artist Stacy Levy collaborates with natural processes like rain, tides, and erosion. This lecture will address how art can create ecological legibility as well as ecological solutions. Stacy graduated with a BA from Yale University and got her MFA from Tyler School of Art at Temple University. She began her work as an urban forester in the Mid-Atlantic region. Stacy has been awarded the Henry Meigs Environmental Leadership Award Penn Future Award for Women in Conservation and a Pew Fellowship in the Arts. She is currently the Stormwater Artist in Residence for Lancaster, Pennsylvania, helping this 250 year old city work out drainage and daylight, daylighting solution, solutions for its urban water issues. Um, so welcome Stacy Levy. Hi, hi, thank you all for coming tonight, or it's, it's afternoon for the West Coast, it's evening for the East Coast. I love how unifying Zoom is, that people can attend from all parts. Um, that's been kind of great. I've certainly seen a lot more people speak uh, this this past year than I, uh, than I have before. So there's the side that you don't have to travel to hear all sorts of different people. Anyway, welcome, and I'm gonna be talking about how um, art, particularly the art that I do, is more like a verb than a noun, and how I collaborate with both ecology and with engineers, building architects, landscape architects, ecologists, to, in order to make these projects. And we'll just jump on in. So, oops, that's not what I wanted to hit. Okay, hitting my space bar, we should move forward. So, um, we, we definitely have issues with understanding the natural world. It's kind of it's starting to really become a missing component of the information that we have. We just don't get how the world works around us. And um, it, this disability to grasp patterns and processes of the nature that surrounds us is problematic. And so I really think that art has a very big role to help address this lack of understanding. Um, so I'm looking into how art can help us forge an understanding. How can we how can we get it, and how can art be part of that translation? And it's also very important that art is is going to make this translation more inclusive, more humane, and accessible in every day than our other translator, which has been science up until this point. These patterns that are all throughout nature they repeat in so many different scales from tree limbs to watersheds. And it, they're very much inside us too. They're part of us. So ignoring these patterns comes at a certain peril and also a certain lack of, you're missing something if you don't sort of see how the world works. Just the fact of this dendritic pattern which turns up in tree limbs is also is what our watershed is composed of and happens to be the same system that we move blood through our body. So life-giving forces are often moved with these same dendritic patterns. So art becomes a really great tool for translating these patterns, translating what's going on in nature, making them understandable and legible so that people can go in and read the information and get it. Um, it's all about giving kind of like clues and handholds, small explanations about what's going on out there as we're walking through it, because nature is happening everywhere. No matter how much glass and concrete you have, you still have nature happening just in the spores that are being carried through the air, even in the most urban settings. Um, 
But the way I learned about nature was mostly through the language of science. I took botany and biology and ecology and forestry. And um, I have a little bit of training in, in this language, but it's very hard for me to get. And I know that it's extremely hard to understand this language unless you're trained in it. And most people are not. And so it feels like a very distancing thing to have nature um, sort of formed by our understanding through science. And I think that art can be yet another translator of nature because communicating science is becoming just about as important as science itself. We have tremendous amounts of data on all sorts of things, such as climate crisis, but very few conduits for understanding what's going on. So this necessity that we make these patterns, these processes of ecology apparent um, is really, really important, particularly right now. So getting this kind of hands-on experience for people, for different kinds of learners, we can't expect that everyone does things with textbooks and learns through graphs and learns through um, equations. Some of us are very visual learners, very kinetic learners. And so there should be other ways to understand what's going on in the world. And nature is a little tricky. Oftentimes its components are way too small, like microorganisms here, giant diatoms here, the mussels lunch. Um, sometimes nature is simply too vast. The watershed is a very hard idea to, to grasp, um, even though it's coming right through our backyards, right under our city streets, but it's, it's very hard for us to sense. Sometimes it's too vast and too invisible, this, how watersheds connect to larger areas, like you're up, you're way up and out of the coastal area. How does it ever, how does that rain ever get down to the ocean? Um, so I'm often making um, projects that are making that connection between when the rain falls and you're, and you're up in the hills and how it gets down to the ocean. That's my dog who often barks during lectures. Sometimes nature is just moving too fast. Hydrological patterns are just so beautiful, but you can hardly ever see them. They're also often transparent, but even when there's foam on the water and you can see them swirling, they're too quick to grasp. Though sometimes you get to see it if you put um, cream in your iced coffee, that swirling pattern is the same thing that's happening in a river, in a stream, in, in the ocean. And oftentimes things are too slow. The tide is very hard to see because it moves so slowly. It moves a foot an hour on average in our mid-Atlantic urban tidal rivers. That's really hard to pinpoint. So that too slowness or things are just too old. The system, the ecological system, such as the underground watersheds, which have all been covered up and put into conduits, put into pipes, sewer pipes in particular, they're all concealed by the grid of our city. So they're too old for us to understand that ecology until Hurricane Sandy comes through, drops so much rain on the ground and these rivers rise or streams rise up again like ghosts of their former selves. But art has a superpower. It can be an extremely uh, powerful tool for understanding change, how the environment changes. And change is an absolute key part to anything natural. It's always going to be changing. So I think that what's really important is that art is becoming more about being a verb and showing change in nature and less about being a noun, showing something that remains unchanged. And for me, that was a big, that was a big crossover to go from something that was eternally on a pedestal and only got dusted to looking into the verbal action of art making and maybe being more about the dust collection on the piece and less about the piece itself. Um, so showing these less visible things is, is something that art can do really well, and particularly in the city. Most of the nature I work in is not like Grand Tetons style nature, but it's nature, the smaller nature that's happening in our urban areas. Um, so understanding change in the tide is really key and really in interesting. And you can start to understand more about how our urban rivers are impacted by climate crisis. Um, I feel strongly that we need to know about tides it, that are passing through our cities because 
at this point, we have a tremendous fear of them, particularly in um, metropolitan areas in the East Coast, we are worried about sea level rise as we should be, but we start to sort of blame the tide and the rising of the tide and being afraid of a piece of ecology that's happening in your city is not the approach you need to take to be resilient. So we really need to learn about the tide clock in our urban rivers and learn about our, our local ecology. And we need to bring everyone to the table, not just the not just other scientists. Everyone needs to be looking at how nature is working in the city and considering all the types of nature from wilderness, which some people might deal with, I do not, to urban nature, which I spent a lot of time trying to explain. Because if we ignore nature, um, we're going to be in, in trouble. We're not gonna be able to even begin to solve any of our problems. Um, because we cannot live outside of nature. I heard a, a, someone say in a, a slideshow the other day, um, nature has no mercy. And it's sort of true, nature is just gonna do what it does. So we have to get jiggy with it. We have to understand it to live with it. And I feel that art can't just stand back and simply document the problems that we have, even though that's been really, really an, an important step that artists took. The next step that we are now in is to not just show how badly we live with nature, but to try and change how we're living with nature. Because we can't wait for technology to solve climate change. It's not going to, it's not going to take us out of here when we find the perfect something that sucks all the carbon away. That's simply not going to happen. We need to address how we're living together with nature. And art can be a really important part of that attempt at finding solutions. So I, this is my motto these days, art needs to be a strategy, not an accessory to the site, not parsley around the pig of the building, but actually doing something. We have to approach our sites with a sense of strategic change. Um, art needs to help us find better solutions than what we've previously come up with. And I point the finger here at engineers who have come up with most of our solutions and how we live with nature. And they've made terrible, terrible mistakes for 400 years. And I think it's time for them to move aside and work, move aside and give more space to work with artists. It's time to start practicing what we want the world to be, how we want the world to be. And if we don't put that into practice, we're not going to know. So I think that art's role, and this is what I love about Weed because they feel strongly about this role too, is creating solutions to site issues. Though this is rather a new role for art. Some of us have been doing this for a while, but it's not considered ordinary in a certain way. And it's not the stuff that always turns up at galleries and museums. Um, Climate crisis is gonna be bringing us some big extremes with more rain and more drought. And in the East Coast, we're gonna be getting more rain. You can see we're in where I live in the, that dark teal, we're up 300% in rainfall at a certain, this was in 2018, which was a wet year, but um, we're, it's something we're gonna to have to contend with. But even without this increased rain, all the rain that's been falling on our developed areas, on our lawns and our parking lots has been flowing directly down to streams without anything buffering it. It's overwhelming the streams with too much water, uh, which is introduced too quickly all at once. It's an absolute feast of the worst sort. It's like, it's like stuffing a goose. And then it scours out the banks and ruins the streams. When nature is working well, the rain has time and place to soak in. And those things are very important to remember that rain needs time and it needs a place or a space. Um, and uh, this was a site that I was given, this completely worthless monoculture of lawn, which everyone thought was okay because lawn is familiar and you, everyone knows what to do with it. You mow it, of course, and then you walk on it. Of course, no one walked on this piece of lawn, but, and it has nothing to offer. It, this drain is draining basically directly to a creek. So my project um, at the school, the Springside School was to create conveyance and infiltration to prevent the the rainwater from running directly into the creek and scouring the banks and ruining the habitat in the creek. Um, so you can see that it rains, precipitation comes down to the gutter, comes through these watershed shaped gutters and conveyance, and then goes into the rain garden for infiltration. Um, this project is creating much more biodiversity with plants. 
it's creating a lot more space for the rain and a lot less space for people, except this space is far more interesting to sit in this small terrace versus this large swath of meaningless grass is a really different experience. And now people are out here reading and watching pollinators pollinate and collect, collect pollen and birds fly through. It's a very different space, even though we have much less of it, a much smaller amount. And so that kind of land grab that humans love to do doesn't have to happen. We need to give more space to nature. Here we are, the whole school planted this iris river, planted the entire garden, in fact, from kindergarten to, to 12th graders. There you can see it le um, leading out to the road. This is a, a project that can be um, sort of sat in and enjoyed. It also can be seen very quickly with a 40 mile an hour view on the road so that it's, um, it's, it's understandable quick at a quick scale of speed and a slow scale of speed. Um, but sharing the real estate with rain is something we really have to learn to do. We cannot take the lion's share any longer. Um, unfortunately, urban hardscape does not live, and suburban hardscape, which is equally in, in trouble with this, doesn't live well with rain. Um, and though we often think, when we're thinking about climate crisis, our first thoughts are the coastal cities and what's going to happen to them when they flood. But really, it's going to be pluvial flooding that's going to affect more of us in America and, and everywhere, too. It's going to happen because there's more rain, a more frequency of rainfall, and the intensity, the amount of rain that falls out of the sky every time it rains is going to be um, increasing. So art has a real ability to address this issue of rain having no place to go. And I'll show you a few projects with that too. Um, this is another conveyance of rain project. This one is moving the water from the roof to the wetlands. All the gray water is recycled on the site. It's the Frick Environmental Center and it is a living building challenge, which means that Nothing comes into the building that the building doesn't generate itself and nothing goes out with waste. It's, it's, an, it's a, like an organism and it's an entire system. So on this, in this case, all the gray water is recycled on the site and the artist is responsible for getting, the art is responsible for getting the gray water from the roof past the building and down into the wetlands. And I feel very important that it's very important that this be celebrated. This shouldn't be hidden in a pipe. This should be experienced. It's wonderful when it rains. It's thrilling. But this work does require a great deal of collaboration with other disciplines. I, in this case, I'm working with landscape and building architects. I'm working with engineers and I'm working with ecologists to make sure this thing works. Um, and this is the living building challenge. There are the petals of what's necessary in every single building in order for it to be called the living, to, to sort of gain the living building challenge. And the art was interestingly on two. We hit the beauty pedal, but we also hit the water pedal. So it's interesting that um, art had a very powerful sort of dual footed role in, in this building, gaining its living building challenge status. So I, we had a very specific task to do and it's also something that it needs to do, it needs to work with the rain, but it also has to work in all the dry times that we have too. And that's something very important about um, artful solutions is just because you're always dealing with change, it's not a single type of situation. So you have different seasons, you have different amounts of dryness and you've got to be functional in all of them. So it needs to work in the wet weather. It needs to be big enough to carry all that water and it needs to work in the in-between also when it's, you know, ju it just rained and it's still drying or it's frozen or it's filled with snow. But one of the other things that this um, project was is that it was a kind of mnemonic. It showed you this extrapolated or abstracted pattern so that as you were walking your way down to the, to the, the bigger nature of the nature center, you were catching this, this pattern in your feet and with your eyes. And when you went down to see the stream, you might see that delicate shale geology, which you could have missed otherwise because you've sort of practiced it with a more abstracted version of it. So it's also was it just a it's just a great place to play in the landscape. And I often see kids with like their dinosaurs lining it up as if they're in some great canyon. 
Um, another site issue, um, solving of site issues for infiltration is rain garden at the Schuylkill Center. A lot of my work's in Pennsylvania. This is in Philadelphia. One of, in, I, strong tenet is that buildings, all buildings need to drink their own rainwater. You cannot have a roof and then send your water merrily out somewhere else, passing the buck by using a pipe and sending it usually down into a stream in order to scour out the banks and drive all the critters from the stream. We really need to live differently by embracing the soggy. The soggy is going to be a very important landscape that we have not wrapped our arms around and we're gonna need to get much more loving towards our sogginess and not be afraid of water. People are terribly afraid of water hanging out on the site. Mosquitoes and wet feet and all these other things. But rain must be given time and space to soak in. And we can spare these places and the time for rain. And rain, to be remembered, hits the ground really hard. This is a raindrop hitting the ground. And when it's allowed to just hit without vegetation because we forgot to put any plants there and we took everything away because we were building a new CVS or something, there's a lot of damage that goes on when there's no vegetation. It can really, rain falling on unvegetated soils is a, is a real problem. So one of the other responsibilities we have is when we're making a home for the rain, we need to not just give it time and space, but we also need to vegetate that area. We need to let the plants thrive in that area. So we have to rethink our relationship to this life-giving substance. It's not something we want to get rid of in a pipe. It's something we want to keep on our site and celebrate and make a real home for the rain from the sky all the way down to the ground. And you can see here this idea of the bunk bed system. We're creating spaces that share the landscape, throws people out and just, and just says nature is the only way to go. It's trying to work with people and to have them live well with nature. And uh, the, this bunk bed idea that the rain is down and the plants go up and the people have this kind of hovering space in between where they can keep their feet dry. But this idea that we need a more equitably shared space for people and plants, we can no longer take it all for ourselves. Humans are extremely greedy and we have to undo that in how we build and how we make art. So you can see there's a great deal of engineering for infiltration here. This all has to be fathomed so that I can have the 500 year storm be contained and not go into the basement of the building, very important. And the plants that I'm planting are going to be correct. Those that will be in the wetter areas can tolerate wet, have wetter feet and there'll be drier ones up on the berms. So there's a great deal of engineering that allows the water to soak in and infiltrate. And it's planted with diverse vegetation, often in these cases by volunteers, but in the future, it does, you should, people should be paid. Um, and it, you get a tremendous diversity of plants, not back with the old monoculture of lawn. So this porous platform for rain and plants and people, all because we're giving space to other things besides ourselves. And it's a cross section of how this works. And this por porosity is a way to welcome the rain. It's a very important thing to think about. We're not, we haven't been very porous. So instead of welcoming the rain, we're usually chasing it off and into, into verges and then into whatever waterway we can find. But we really need to sort of change the system and start to celebrate this amazing stuff called rain. And in the East Coast, and I know I'm talking to all these people um, in, on the West Coast who are dealing with tremendous droughts. We, we have an embarrassment of riches with our rain, but we don't treat it right. And we need to change that. And these spaces all are wonderful uh, outdoor learning areas, classrooms where people can spend time. And um, this idea that it needs to work with every season and, uh, and be a place that, that is welcoming to both people and to rain. There are other site issues too. Typical hardscapes 
um, allow all of this oil, which of course the oil is from the cars that park on the hardscape, but that drops onto the asphalt and the concrete and then flows into the drain, merrily flowing down into the creeks and taking all their nasty pollutants with them. And there are ways to prevent this by creating buffers at the edges of things so that the roots and the, um, the bacteria and the fungus on the roots can process these pollutants, but we often forget to do that. That gets nixed out of the budget half the time. But hardscapes, they'll hold water, but they will not allow infiltration. So this is not time and space for the rain when you see a flooded parking lot. This is a kind of weird holding pattern that we, you know, somebody needs to fix. Um, so how do you make more buffers and more infiltration in a very urban site? Um, here, let's just go back. Uh, so this project is solving ecological issues with art and a kind of biomimicry. I'm looking at infiltration and buffer zones here. And the first thing that I started to think about is um, that people are always trying to keep vegetation out of the out of the hardscape because it breaks up the hardscape except i on this particular site i want to break up the hardscape so the enemy of my enemy is now my friend i want the vegetation to start to get in there and break the hardscape and i'm using the the vegetation has a freeze thaw pattern on the on the east coast and so it's freezing and and, and widening and basically the ice is breaking the hardscape up now, why didn't we come in and just take the hardscape away? The project couldn't afford it. If we had taken all the hardscape and got taken it to a dump, that would have been the entire budget and also just sort of passing the concrete buck down the stream. So we wanted to deal with it more directly. So here we are, there are two, there's asphalt and concrete here. This is dendritic decay garden. So I'm trying to make a garden out of a parking lot, but one that you can park on when necessary. Um, I've drawn the watershed here on these sort of industrial leftovers. We're digging out the asphalt. Um, that's we is me pointing. I, I, my digging days are a little bit over. And um, then planting it and planting it with native vegetation. So this whole idea that we're softening these industrial shoulders, the, Del I'm, the Delaware is like just beyond the screen towards, towards all of you watching, you would all be with the Delaware. Um, this is an, uh, a collaboration with Biohabitats Limited. So here it is after three growing seasons. It takes a while for landscape to take hold it, and you have to be patient and curators and project manager out there, you need to be patient for these projects because they don't happen instantly. And there it is about, this is about five or six seasons later in the fall and it's really grown in and it's all acting like a great buffer zone. So as water is sliding towards the Delaware, which you can see is, is in the vegetation beyond, it's the roots of these plants are picking up many of the pollutants and also slowing the whole process of the water sliding at the river down. So both pollutants and speed has been cut. And that's a very important thing to happen. This is another part of the garden here where we've just chopped up the concrete. You can see the striping from the parking areas still there and planted in between. And there's its first or its third winter, and there it is in its third season. And here, that waiting for vegetation, it really is with perennials a three season wait on the East Coast. It, the first year it sleeps, doesn't do anything, and you panic. The second year it's slowly growing and you're getting a little worried. And then the third growing season is a tremendous leap of vegetation, and you feel like, yes, it's doing what we had planned it for it to do. And uh, there it is in the fall. All these incredibly beautiful native plants that have different personalities in the spring and summer and fall, so much better than the, than the monoculture of, of turf grass. Um, and though people are, are worried that these are too wild and woolly, the world should just be more wild and woolly. Uh, it's important to know that this is not work that's done by the lone artist or the lone landscape architect. We're that heroic position that there's a single person who saves the day is a myth and completely wrong for how we have to start working now. All of this work needs to be collaborative. We have to cross disciplines and everyone has to be heard too. A lot of times the artist comes in and really that parsley around the pig problem, 
always happens like, oh, little artist, you, not that I'm a little artist, but you know, small at least, but they're like, yes, middle-aged lady artist person, we'll let you put your art in when we're done everything. That is exactly what we need to avoid. The artist needs to get in early in a collaborative position with the other disciplines and it needs to be very cross-disciplinary. Art does not get laid into the site last because then it cannot be about the process and it can't be about change. And art that doesn't change is probably not doing all that much for the environment. So that collaboration, it's a collaboration across disciplines, but it's also a collaboration with nature. You have to understand what nature is wanting to do and try and support what it needs to do and, um, and everyone needs to be working towards that. I often say that nature is my client because you have to be working with nature's needs coming first and foremost and the human client's needs somewhat secondary even if they sign the checks. But these projects are also about bringing people, uh, bringing a way for people to change their relationships with nature. It's not the kind of engineering that hides the solution under the ground. It shows the solution right there at your feet. It enables you to interact with it, to play with it, to watch it through different seasons. It's not about um, the secret engineered solution that nobody would have to worry their little, their little selves with. It's encompassing and it's for everyone who's using the site, including other species. So here's another um, project, which was also using biomimicry as a, a solution for water pollution. Uh, this is an urban lake in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, and the problem is tremendous amount of runoff from agricultural runoff from chicken farms and suburban runoff from chem lawn, uh, creating an, a nitrogen and phosphorus over nutrification pollution uh, and turning the entire lake into a icky green. So what does art do in this situation? Well, the biomimicry part is I'm thinking, okay, I've got this green lake, what treats lake water or pond water and wetlands do, but I can't add any wetlands because it's all privately owned along the edge, but I can do a floating wetland and the floating wetlands are used all over the world for um, sewage treatment and for um, water systems treatment. We, we don't use them quite as much as we should be. So. Um, but they're typically not very visually interesting. Um, and I have spent a great deal of time looking at this project. This is uh, the Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. I've always referred to it as the Mona Lisa of Earthworks because if you mention that you're an environmental artist, that little image is gonna ping into someone's head. And I think the first 20 years of articles being written about me always had a picture of the Spiral Jetty. And so I kind of had to make peace with that. And I was thinking I'm going to meet this piece part way and I'm going to make a piece that is the form of the Spiral Jetty, but the function of biomimicry uh, floating wetlands, a plant filled lush habitat. Um, this is how floating wetlands work. They're filled with plants, but it's not actually the plants that are doing the work. It's the cyanobacteria and other microorganisms living on the plant roots that are absorbing these excess nutrients, all of this pollution. And the plants are growing happily because they actually like the nitrogen, the phosphorus. And it, meanwhile, it's making fabulous habitat for fish in the jungle of roots below and for birds in the floating stems above where there are no feral cats to uh, eat their eggs and eat their young. So it's a living, breathing artwork and it's eco art. It is not land art from the seventies, which is, um, I think a real problem is that we have this sort of old school that clings to this idea of what our art should be. Uh, these heroic slashes in cliffs. And our art is not about that. It's about listening to nature and working with ecological systems and thinking about other species besides ourselves. And certainly thinking about more than just the visual, like, oh, someone will see this. Someone's going to live in this. Someone's water is gonna be changed by this. And there are going to be other species that are, are going to be nesting here. So it's a very different mindset than the land art of the seventies was. There's Juncus diffusus, soft rush, which is growing. Um, both its um, foliage is growing and its roots, which you can't see is, are increasing. The roots dangle down about three feet for every single plant. 
my minimalist training came up because I did use a monoculture here because I was just experimenting and I kind of needed to keep it a little simpler. If I was to do this again, I would probably use a series of different species. Um, but it's, a, it's an amazing habitat for birds and fish and turtles and that cat protection is really important. And then the fishermen loved it because I made this great fishing habitat because the fish like to be in the tangle of roots underneath. So, and it became a destination kayakers would had somewhere to go to. And um, this kind of artful solution that's made with working with ecology and working with engineers and ecologists can be a really powerful thing. And um, it was up temporarily, but it was, hugely enjoyed by people. And my, my daughter handed me this recently, this beautiful picture of the chicken spiral, which I just had to throw in. <laughs> the next living spiral. So working directly with nature, that's not exactly a new job for art, even though I often frame it as such, but we've been doing that for a little bit. Certainly the Hudson River School of Painters showed people, for the first time, showed people the value, the spiritual value of the natural world and saying, you know, when you look at a forest, it's not just about board feet timber. There's something important there that is beyond the resource that you can extract. And that is, hugely inspirational to people and a new view for many people and really was very important in starting the conservation movement um, to preserve large tracts of the Adirondacks. And uh, in general, that art form woke people up to the value of nature, which they were busily trapping and cutting and burning uh, to the ground. Um, so and uh, now I concentrate, you know, the newer artists are often concentrating more on how nature in the city can be translated and made part of people's lives too. This is the Ontario Science Center. So it's very important for me to cr be creating windows of understanding to make this unfamiliar natural world more familiar. One of the best compliments I ever got when was from someone who walked past a project and then I was talking to her and she said, I'll never look at a puddle the same way again. And that to me seemed to be a great victory in, in understanding. So, so this new kind of work of combining engineer, engineering with art to change the outcomes of our sites, of our everyday sites. Um, and giving us a new way with the rest of nature and not just be so human centric. Um, it's very important to think when we're making art that we actually do have a wider audience and, than humans. Um, we have turtles sometimes, as you can see in the lower right hand corner. This tool for making nature legible is really important. And I hope that people who are doing this kind of work will kind of run with it, knowing that it's part of their mission, that they're, they, they love nature and making nature comprehensible to others is a really important thing to do. And then creating the solutions too is, is the next step that we all need to take. And I, I love this, this is Aja Monet saying, we create because we are possessed by our questions, not because we have the answers. I did not go to engineering school. I do, I'm not always absolutely certain that my idea of solution will work, but I'm obsessed to try it out because current well-schooled engineers haven't been getting things to work either. So I think it's time for artists to give it a stab, an educated stab, a collaborative stab, but for us to step out and see what we can do to change how we build this world. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all spending this evening with me and I'll take any questions, large, small, or any, any, about anything um, after, uh, after this whole thing. So, oh, one last thing is that just to remember that we're practicing the world we want to live in and that the art that we're making now is strategic. It's not an accessory. We're no longer going to be jewelry for lobbies. We're going to be out there working for other species and making things happen for the world. Thanks. Yay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacy. You're um, welcome. That was great. <laughs>
Yeah, I can't wait to um, I can't wait to travel again and um, go to the East Coast and see some of your work in person. Um, I'd like to open the floor. Yeah, up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to open the floor up. Um, if people could raise their hands if they have any questions for Stacy, um, and then I will switch between that and then also going through the chat. Um, if you have questions and would like to type them out that way, but there were some questions during your presentation. Um, so let's see, I have uh, Halima, uh, I'm gonna unmute you, go ahead and ask your question. Um, hi, Stacy. Uh, my name is Halima. Uh, my question is, I'm really interested in what you do. Um, growing up, I had this image of me living in a, um, wind turbine, trying to live sustainably as a, like, you know, that was my ultimate goal as a grown up when I, when I grew up. Uh, I'm a grown up now. <laughs> and I still, I can't imagine that happening, right? And uh, now, recently I've been working at the watershed uh, where I live and I'm thinking maybe it's possible. Uh, since I'm still in college, I guess my question is, what should I be studying if I wanna do what you're doing or if I wanna work towards solutions like this? Uh, that's a very good and, and tricky question because there are, there are more art schools that are being set up to work with ecology as a sort of partner. And um, I have to confess that I'm not that up on exactly what programs people are doing. I have been sort of outside of the school system for a long time. Um, and it, it is tricky. If I was to go back to school now, though, I would probably go back in engineering if I could. Um, it would be hard to keep a foot in design, but or I would go back as a landscape architect because in some ways what you learn there, there's a kind of collaborative sense in landscape architecture that you, that you learn in the school, that you, you see how many parts that you have to braid together and you know that you're not gonna do it yourself. Um, I think that's very important training. Um, I think art schools are slowly catching up. You have to look at a, an art school that has a strong public or social practice component or is doing environmental art and not sort of Michael Heiser environmental art, but like something that's really engaging the ecology of the site. Thanks. Um, I'm doing a quick one from the chat. Um, Lauren asks, when you have identified an eco organization that you would like as a collaborator, but you didn't have an introduction or network contact, how would you go about inviting or cultivating that a relationship? Mm, I, you start by calling people up um, yeah. and or writing them and then calling them up. It's very important to talk to them on the phone. Um, and a lot of times there'll be these nascent connections that you have until you have a job where there's money to give people to, to um, collaborate with you. Uh, nobody's gonna do it for free. And um, so you wait for the right job to come up and you remember those people and start talking to them about whether they wanna collaborate with you or not. Okay, great. Um, how about Simone? You had a question? Yes. Hi, Stacy. I just really want to commend you for, I just think that what you're doing um, is just a feminine approach to changing the face of our planet where we've got 2000 years of masculine building and destruction and pushing forward. And you're just all about cooperation. It's just really inspirational. And Good. yeah, Quest is doing this besides the other artists work level with so many differences. There, there are there are numbers of artists out there. Um, uh, Sarah Cavage is here. Cavage is here tonight. Um, she's she works in this way. Eve Mosier works in this way too. Um, mm -hmm. There are uh, artists out there and you often find them sort of clustered around places that are supportive of this kind of work. Um, the Schuylkill uh, Center for Environmental Education in Philadelphia has been a great place where it's, it's really worked hard to carefully blend ecologists and ecology with artists, not 
having artists just work with the forest as a backdrop, which is very typical of a lot of places, but to actually combine um, the disciplines. And so that's a really great resource to look for. And Wave Hill has done some interesting work too with Jennifer McGregor too. So that's, that's another place to check out. Okay, I just haven't seen anything like your work. It's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And that 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 idea that this is a a, a feminine a feminist version of of like a redo of land art is is really true. I really I take that to heart. That I think it was it was a great idea to get out of the gallery. It was a great, wonderful, and expansive idea to address nature, but not with a big grip handshake and then a kick in the butt, which a lot of that work was. And it took me years to kind of get an understanding of what was appealing about that work and what was really not appealing about that work and ineffectual. Um, and it was, it, it does take a feminist angle to, to work that out and not just accept it as, as that heroic art gesture which we so value, we're so taught to value. And I've take, it's taken me years to un, not unvalue it, but to get that out of my system and think about working in a different way. It's not how our art system is set up, but it doesn't mean that you have to work according to how things are set up. Yes, thank you so much. Um, let's go with uh, Amanda. Amanda, do you have a question? Are you with us, Amanda? Yes, yes, thank oh, great, you. Great, great. Glad to you. Um, yeah. Now, wonderful discussion, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also an artist and I've been, you know, very interested in being able to, to find a community of artists that are also interested in, in ecological issues and the degradation of our natural world. I've been, it seems sometimes when I, when I look um, for that community, it's difficult to find. So could, I really appreciate everything that you're doing and, and what you're what you're interested in artistically. So is there um, would is there any like community of artists or any particular individuals or institutions that you'd recommend for for trying to uh, trying to get involved with other artists that have mutual interests and that might be able to uh, um, be interested in showing uh, work or or getting it out there, getting that that message out there about the problems that we're facing. So we can communicate that more to the public. I can see that I'm gonna to have to compile a list because this is exactly when you forget everything. The, I mean, WEED is a very important organization and that's important. Um, and um, there, are some, there are wonderful artists out there who are, are doing it. Eco Art Space is a great thing to join too. That's Patricia Watts um, has kept that on. Amy, she, it was a collaborative effort with Amy Lipton who's recently passed away sadly. And fortunately Patricia is spearheading that and taking it to new places and expanding who's um, part of it. So that's a really wonderful place. Eco Art Space should definitely be looked at. Um, as a as a place, and um, just sort of keeping your ear to the ground. That's sort of what I do because I'm not in the academic world. Um, I haven't. I I give crits, but I haven't taught. Um, it it makes me not always know what kind of institutes there are out there. But um, keeping your ear to the ground is important. And check out Eco Art Space. Okay, and I'm sorry. What was the first one? That Weed. What was it? We the the what the, who's producing this? The W E A D yes. Women <laughs> Eco Art Dialogue. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say. I was going to say, Amanda, if you'd like Please. to join us, um, yes. visit um, weedartist.org um, after the presentation. Sorry, yeah. it looks like we're freezing a little bit. I'm not hearing everything that's being said. Okay. Uh, I would say, to, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. We can put it in the chat too. Put okay. It in the chat. Put, it, put it in the yeah. chat. Weedartists.org. Um, Appreciate. It. Yes. Please join us. Become a member. Um, I most recently joined maybe six months ago, and um, I've been lucky enough to become part of the board and help work and organize 
the art and activism series. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Oh, and here's a DeWitt Godfrey just came in with a, um, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, oh God, it just, uh, Queens College, the social practice Queens is, is doing some interesting stuff. That's worth looking at. Thank, Thank you. you, DeWitt. Okay, I'm going to move on to some of the chat questions. Um, Stacy, do you have any advice for ecologists that want to bring more art into their work and their teaching? Oh, that's a great question because that that sort of is is a really key piece because it's like it's not just the responsibility of artists to run around trying to find scientists, though we do that a lot and we enjoy working with scientists, but this, the scientific mind is so similar to the artist's mind. A lot of people have, you know, I've spent a lifetime hearing how different science is from art and how they're on opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're definitely the twins that got separated at birth um, because there's a love of the natural world and a, and a desire to find out how it works. It's just that maybe artists don't need the same kind of answers as scientists do, um, but it's very important to, to um, for in, uh, ecologists to find artists too. Where they do that, the same sort of spaces. I mean, really, um, eco arts, I think, does have ecologists have signed up. And, and we, this would be a very interesting thing for you to do is to kind of have a matchmaking program going on. Because I do think that we need to have matchmakers for it. It's hard, it's hard to do. I go to a number of scientific or, you know, ecological conferences and speak at them. But it is it's tricky to do because you're crossing these very hard boundaries and we're trying to erase these boundaries, but it's, it's hard. And so um, I do think that, that institutions need to almost set up matchmaking, uh, meet and greet with artists and, and, uh, architect, uh, artists and uh, ecologists and biologists and zoologists so that we can um, work together. And really the, the best thing is when you, an artist can find a project that has a site that would will be dealing directly with some piece of nature and figuring out who they need to help them with it and then seeking those people out and that that tends to be the way that I do it if I'm I'm working with water I need a hydrologist and I need an aquatic ecologist and or biologist so um, you sort of look at the site to inform who you you need to work with but I hope that you know that institutions can kind of create these places where we have a lobby in which to meet. Great. Um, looks like there's a couple of people who asked about your slides, and I just want to say that um, I am recording the talk today with Stacy, and we will have this um, this talk up on our YouTube channel um, under Weed Artists. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question um, from Jenna. She's asking you, uh, do you have a resource for good wetland species for Northeast Pennsylvania? It's a very specific question. Do I, I don't, I don't want to have one at my fingertips, but um, there are tremendous resources out there um, to, to figure out like what you would use and in what situations, because the situation with the hydrology is really important in terms of choosing a species. Um, so there is someone, there's someone on this, the site, uh, who, who may, may know a, a good source, um, but a, a little bit of, uh, searching and calling around would, would find it. Cause it's very dependent on, on where you are. And is it, you know, is it, uh, is it a saltwater wetland? Is it a brackish wetland? Is it, is it freshwater? Is it, you know, lodic or lentic? So all, there are lots and lots of questions before you can say, oh, star, the star thing. Not frag mighty, so. so. <laughs> um, okay, and then let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna make a quick announcement as we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, and then I'm going to um, maybe take a few more questions in the chat if there's some extra people who want to write that right now. Um, I just want to take a quick second to say, um, let's see, that we do have a, a weed show called Traces that is in Danville. And um, we will have a discussion of that next Saturday. I'm going to explain a little bit more. Um, looks like a lot of people really would like to collaborate with you, Stacy. <laughs> chat. Um, 
Um, is there any residents? Because it's rather hard to do right now. I mean, I'm, we're having trouble. I mean, everything sort of is in the planning phase right now with getting things. Yes. Uh, uh, I guess I'm going to leave this with the last uh, <laughs> last question here. Um, Oh no, I've cut out a little bit. She froze up. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing, give it a second. One thing that for collaborative, um, for collaborative things can is it's excellent to start with schools too when um, environmental programs and biology programs can step over to the art program um, on the same campus and try and figure out a project to do together. That's a great way to do um, a sort of start early and, and figure it out. I, I just was working with Towson University doing a very similar thing where we were taking the art department over to the biology department and working with the biologists in order to, um, and working with the sustainability office to create a project for their campus. Amazing. Well, I think that is about it. It's about six o'clock right now. I wanna thank you, Stacy, um, so much for this great talk. Um, it was very inspiring. I want to, um, thank the other members of board members of weed who are participating today. Um, and if um, you guys tune in to our next episode um, or next week, next Saturday, weed will be having a talk about our traces exhibit. Um, and if you want to find out more about weed, or if you want to get involved in the eco artist, um, dialogue group, um, that's put on this programming today, um, you can visit weedartists.org. And if you like the programming today with Stacy, feel free to donate as we do all of this work um, just for you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to see some of the past episodes um, of Art and Activism, um, there's an episode of mine, Kate Kwaimoku. It's called Trash Talk that talks about trash in our post-consumer society and there's also an um another episode created with christina bartea which is art of playing with the rain about water collection and other sorts of interesting things um anyway thank you so much for staying here and um hope to see you in our next um art and activism episode thank you so much thank you everyone